Uh, we serve a good God, don't we? You know, I love singing the songs of faith. The songs of faith build you up. The songs of faith can sustain you through, through hard times, amen. The songs of faith can be a way to just celebrate the goodness of life, the most simple parts of our lives. Singing the songs of faith is powerful. Often when people are coming to me for advice, one of the things I ask them is, I ask them, do you worship? Do you worship on your own? I'm like, what do you mean? Do you just sing songs of faith sometimes? And often they'll say no. And beloved, I just, I just encourage you to sing the songs of faith throughout the week, not just when you come to church, amen? Let's pray and get into God's word. Father, we just thank you and praise you for this opportunity to gather together as a community and partake in your preached word. Now, Lord, I just pray that I decrease so that you, by your Holy Spirit, may increase through me your vessel for the next few minutes. Father, I ask that your anointing be upon us as a community. I ask, Lord God, that you give us eyes to see what you're showing us and ears to hear what you're saying to us and the mind of Christ to comprehend it. Father, I ask that you give us courage to face the stuff of our lives. And Father, lastly, I ask that you increase our capacity to navigate the terrain. We dedicate this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, our text today is found in John chapter 6. And this is a familiar story to many of us. And I've been reading and hearing this text taught to me as a child and then later hearing other men and women of God expound on it. And I hope it's a blessing for you this morning. John chapter 6, the first few verses of that in your Bible, it may be entitled, Jesus Feeds the 5,000. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Pas Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. Verse 7, Philip answered, It would take almost a year's wages to buy enough food, for, to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another's disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far would they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves. He gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Verse 14. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. This morning, beloved, as we explore the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, I wish to draw your attention to two verses, verses 5 and 6, and I'll read them again. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming to him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. 
for he had already for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Beloved, the title of a message today is It's Only a Test and Will You Pass? Amen. So this is a very familiar story to us. And we know everywhere Jesus goes, he does miracles. And we see this throughout the four Gospels. Jesus feeds multitudes, he heals the sick, he opens the eyes of the blind, he gives voice to the mute. He even heals the cripple. Jesus does so many miracles that at this point, I mean, there are just thousands following him because Jesus is the man. If you have a need, just follow Jesus and you might get a miracle. Amen. But, but this is an interesting story because the disciples know exactly what Jesus is capable of doing because they had seen him take very little and multiply it and feed thousands before. They had seen him raise the dead. They had seen him open the eyes of the blind. So they're having this dialogue as if they don't know the answer to the problem. I think if I was there, I would have said, yo, Jesus, remember what you did last time? This kid here has a little bit. Why don't you just multiply it like you always do? Jesus would say, you know, Stefan, you really understand. I think I'll do a miracle, right? Wouldn't it be nice if life was like that? But it's interesting. Why does Jesus test Philip? The text says that this is a test for Philip. And I have to tell you, I've read the story many times. I've heard a lot of people expound on it, but the, for the first time as I was preparing this message, honestly, I was stumped. I was so stumped that I thought, you know what? There's a message here to be preached because I don't understand this. But here's something to pay attention to in the text. The, the Bible is really silent about why Jesus tests him because, <coughs> excuse me, um, the text says that he knows what he was going to do. Now, it's interesting that this conversation is with Philip also, because when we read the four Gospels, we know that Philip was just a bad dude. I mean, he had his act together. Philip is credited with spreading the Gospel throughout parts of Africa. That's how faithful he was. He wasn't a Peter who had highs and lows, and you never know what Peter was going to do, right? Philip was more steady. Philip followed the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But yet, we see that he's being tested. So we can make some conclusions about what the test is not, okay? Based on what we know, we don't see that Philip had did anything wrong. Now, this is important for us this morning. I hope someone hears me because you see, beloved, life circumstances will lie to you and tell you that things are happening in your life because you've done something wrong or because there's something wrong with you. Oh, we got to stay there a minute. We got to let that marinate. Some of you are going through stuff in your life and the circumstances of it is trying to convince you that you've done something wrong. Actually, the devil wants you to face a test or a trial and conclude that God really doesn't love you, that God really doesn't believe you're all that. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible teaches that we are made in his image after his likeness. And so God places high value on your life. But Satan would use the trials and tests of our life to convince us that God doesn't love us. Beloved, testing and trials are a part of everyday life. Yet we see it necessary that Jesus decided to test Philip. 
Now, the Greek word there used here, test, trial, uh, I believe the King James renders it prove, is a positive test. It's not a negative test. Jesus is not testing Philip to show Philip what's wrong with him. Philip hasn't done anything wrong. It's not a test to find out, okay, are you loyal to me or not? No, it's a positive test. The Greek here is positive. In other words, it's a test so that Philip gains wisdom and knowledge. Hey, beloved, I may not like the thought that God tests me, but here's the reality about God. God does test me, but it's for my good. This is a reality of life, and the prosperity gospel will try to convince us that because we're good Christians, we shouldn't go through anything. Matter of fact, you can go through your cable television and you will see uh, men and women of God with thousands following them, thousands buying their books. And I'm not knocking anyone, but I just want you to understand that there is a gospel out there that's very American. And it will tell you that when you have faith and you do what the Bible says, you won't be tested. Oh, that's not true. You know, it was interesting. A few years ago, um, Hazel and I went to Africa, and uh, we met a group of pastors um, at a local university. And when they heard there were black pastors coming, they wanted to meet us because they had many of them had never met um, a black American pastor. Usually, they're all white Americans, and so they wanted to meet us. And it was my wife and I, and we were surrounded with about eight. Uh, leaders at, you know, throughout Africa. And one of the things they asked me was, pastors, how do you handle the prosperity gospel? Because we see it robbing our people. Beloved, don't, do, don't, don't be duped by the devil. Okay? Don't believe that because you are going through trials, because you are going through a test, that it is because something is wrong with you. No, not at all. Not necessarily. Now, there might be something wrong with you, okay? Let's just own up. We do have our, the mess in our lives, right? But that's not what this message is talking about. Those of you that have made bad decisions and you're just going through stuff, okay, Somebody say amen. But life happens. The truth is, when God tests us, the test is designed to help us. Do you hear me today? Isn't it interesting that some of us go through life avoiding tests? I did. <laughs> Look, I had to take algebra one and two, two to, well, I had to take algebra two, two times before I could graduate from high school because I was a poor, well, I was a poor student. I'll just be honest. I was just a poor student. I didn't do my homework when I struggled with math instead of coming in and asking for help. I didn't, and guess what I did? I avoided the test. But my counselor, bless his heart, Stetford, you're not getting out of high school till you pass the test. And see, some of us, the truth is, we go through life avoiding pressure, avoiding anything that's a little challenging. Somebody say amen. Amen means I agree. So just look polite so the person next to you won't think you're talk that I'm talking about you. So you say amen. amen. No, but really, some of us go through life avoiding difficulty. We avoid anything that's challenging. And, you know, some of that, the truth is, is we don't want to fail. But God designs tests for our good. A good learning environment will keep you there until you pass the test. Yeah, some of you are like, God, why do I keep going through this? 
Why am I always going through this in my life? Maybe it's a test. And maybe God is going to keep allowing you to go through what you go through because there's lessons that he wants you to learn. I found this true in marriage. Bless Pastor Hazel's little heart. <laughs> you know, there's stuff that we would go through and go through and go through, and we both came to the conclusion that God wants to teach each of us something. But God loves you so much that he's going to allow you to keep going through that, whatever it is you're going through, till you learn what he wants you to learn. So Jesus asked Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Philip says, it would take a small fortune. Philip says, Jesus, I don't have what it takes. I don't have a small fortune. How are we going to do this? Because Jesus, it's beyond my means. Not only did Philip not have enough of what was needed, but Philip also saw no value in what he did have. Look at the text. Jesus, you know, Philip says, it takes a small fortune. I don't have that. Now, Philip is a follower of Jesus. And Philip's reply to Jesus is that he sees no way this need can be met. Look at verse 8. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? I wonder. I wonder, do we see the value in what we do have? Oh, I hope you hear me this morning. Yeah, we know what we don't have. We know what we don't have. But do we truly see the value in what we do have? And do we truly appreciate what it is God has given us? Maybe you're going through something this morning and you really don't value what you do have to the point where all you do is complain about your circumstances. Maybe you haven't even really prayed about it. See, you know, it's kind of like a person that doesn't have enough money to pay their bills, right? They don't try to have a written budget because they, they know they don't have enough. And those of us that understand budgeting or really understand money, we know that if they did a budget, what they have would go farther. We know, some of us know that, don't we? See, it's a test from God. It's a test to see if we value what we have. There's also the issue of stewardship in this text. Am I a good steward over that which God has given me? You know, the Apostle Paul teaches us some things about God. And I like, often I like to go to Apostle Paul when I'm when I'm stressed, when I'm in trials, because the Apostle Paul understands that the stuff of life will cause you to be in a test where you question yourself and you question God. And we know this to be true because in 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul, this is an anointed brother. He's doing signs, miracles, He's the man. He's preaching like nobody has preached. He is expounding on the Old Testament applied to Jesus in such a way that no one can dispute what he's saying. And yet we know that the Apostle Paul has a thorn in his flesh. We know that the Apostle Paul, as 
great as his faith was, he still went through stuff. And he found himself in a trial. He found himself in a test. And he cries out to God. He says, Lord, take this away from me. You know the story. God shows up and says, hey, dude, my faith is or my grace is sufficient for you. It's going to keep you humble. And this is what Paul says in response to that. He says, I delight in weaknesses. Now, how many of us delight in weaknesses? I delight in insults. I delight in hardships. I delight in persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. Now, did Paul enjoy that stuff? No. But what's his point? Trials. That word there proved in the Greek, it's test, it's trials, it's a positive. The stuff of my life works in such a way that when I'm weak, I am strong. Now this is what Jesus says to us in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Mm. Beloved, it's only a test. I wonder, will you pass that test? That's the question for us. Will God get the glory through what we go through? Whether we're at a place of great challenge to perform or whether we're facing Great temptation in our lives. Some of y'all don't know anything about that. Y'all just got it all together. Maybe you're facing persecution on a job that is very unfriendly to Christian values. And they've scoped you out. And they know you're one of those Jesus people. You know, I've worked in some environments where they knew I was a Christian. They just gave me a hard time. So Jesus gives them instructions. Let's go back to the text. Let's pick it up at verse 10, John 6, 10. Jesus says, how the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And they did the same with the fish. Notice that Jesus takes what they had. Jesus gave thanks for what they had. And then Jesus used what they had. You see, that's what Jesus does with us. Jesus drew attention to what they had amongst them. Jesus gave thanks for what they had. And then Jesus used what they had. See, that's how God does us in our lives. I wonder if I recognize what I really have. And I wonder if I really value that which I have. I know it's not enough. But I wonder if I really value it. And I wonder if what I have in my current circumstances, am I a good steward over it? Am I using it? Now, what I have, I'm not just talking money here. I'm not just talking resources. But it really speaks to who I am. Do I understand who I am in Christ Jesus? Oh, I know my brokenness. I know where I fall short in life. I know what I don't do good. Some of us have come up in environments, and it was not healthy. They didn't speak into us. They didn't see the value in us. Maybe when when we should have been, you know, in an art class, they didn't see we had potential to be a great artist. Or maybe they didn't understand that all that, you know, singing we did around, instead of fussing at us, telling us to be quiet, they should have been, you know, trying to encourage us to sing. See, we know what's wrong with us. Maybe you don't, but I know what's wrong with me. But the question is, am I a good steward over me? 
maybe I'm just a good listener. You know, everybody says, ah, he's an introvert. She don't talk much. You know, you never know what she's thinking. But maybe part of your personality is that you have the gift of listening. And you have the potential to be an effective counselor or listener or friend to someone. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you value what you have? Because God values you. God sees the value you have. Are you a good steward over your gifts? Are you a good steward over self? So we understand that there's a test in stewardship. Are we good stewards over our lives? Are we good stewards over our our gifts and talents, and yes, the resources that we have. And do we value that which we have? Do we value who we are? And are we thankful for who we are? And are we thankful for what we have? My wife and I, bless her heart, bless me, because, you know, we serve a financially poor congregation. Matter of fact, I'll just, I'll just, this, this is a prayer request. Out of 15 families, and all of them are in poverty, seven of those families have experienced homelessness this calendar year. That has been so difficult for Pastor Hazel and I to watch. And it's been very difficult to walk alongside those families. And as difficult as that is for Pastor Hazel and I, that doesn't come close to what the family is experiencing. But one of the lessons that I have been learning watching these families is I've watched families be really good stewards over their gifts and talents and what God has given them to navigate this homelessness in a really wonderful way in that God gets the glory. I hope somebody hear me this morning. And we have watched others navigate this homelessness with just anger. Anger and just such an emotional roller coaster to the point where they are paralyzed. Now, do I think that God allows them to go through homelessness to test them? Not at all. Not at all. That's a negative test. But I do see in each of these families' circumstances where there is a test for them to allow God to get the glory through the trial of their life. Oh, I hope somebody hear me this morning. Do we value who we are and what we have? Do we recognize who we are and what we have? And do we use who we are and what we have in such a way that God gets the glory? Do you hear me this morning? See, I just, I just believe that God, for, you know, some of you, you're just in a test. And the test is designed for you to recognize areas of your life where God can get the glory and you can grow. You know, there may be someone watch or, or listening to this by internet. You may have went to the website of In Spirit and you clicked and you, you know and now you're listening to this message and maybe it is witnessing to you. And maybe you come to a point where you realize, yeah, excuse me, I'm just talking to the web, to the world right now because, you know, I do go to your website and I do click on your messages and I do listen. Amen. First, I went to the website because I wanted to know if my messages were on there or if it was just Pastor Randy's, but my message is on your website. But, but listen, I'm talking to someone right now in the privacy of wherever they are globally. 
and they are in a test, and they haven't recognized the fact that they're in a test. So person, whoever you are listening to this message, may the Lord reveal to you who you are, what you have, and what you need to do to pass this test. May the devil be defeated in your life. Hallelujah. May you understand that you are peculiar, loved by God, valued just as you are. And the Lord, through this trial that you're in, wants you to learn life lessons. Can the church say amen? So, beloved, Philip asked a question, and God takes a moment to teach him a life lesson. And here it is. Do we understand who we are and what we have? Do we value who we are and what we have? And do we utilize who we are and what we have for God's glory? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you and praise you. Thank you for being the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, we remember that it's only a test, and yes, we will pass the test in Jesus' name. Father, we recognize that you will test our faith so that we can understand that we must depend on you, whether it's being a good steward over a lot or whether it's being a good steward over a little, whether it's recognizing who we are in Christ Jesus, or whether it's recognizing the responsibility that we have because we understand who we are in Christ Jesus. Father, we recognize that under the sound of my voice, some of us may not be followers of Jesus Christ. Lord, it is our prayer. We release our faith on behalf of someone else right now, that they will come to understand that the testing of who they are is only to bring them to the feet of Jesus. Lord, may your blessing be upon us. May you strengthen us, comfort us, and encourage us this day in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we recognize that under the sound of my voice here in this sanctuary, and those listening globally, maybe they're at a place where they're weak in their faith and they've been challenged and they're not even sure about this being a Jesus follower. Well, Lord God, for the person that is in doubt, for the person that is struggling in their faith, we release our faith on behalf of them. We intercede for one another in the name of Jesus. And so, Lord God, we say Thank you. Lord God, thank you for being bigger than our circumstances. Lord God, thank you for being greater than anything we will ever face in our life. And Lord, we're careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, I hope you've been blessed this morning. You know, my mother, bless her heart, Dr. Ella Mary Sims, she would say, you know, Stetford, when they invite you to come preach, don't be long, son. The Sims are long-winded, y'all. <laughs> She'd say, now, Stetford, listen to me, son. They'll amen you. But if you're long, they won't invite you back. So, here, hey, listen, listen. When Pastor Randy comes back, you tell him, we got out at 10 minutes early. <laughs> hey, listen, thank you so much for inviting me back. Listen to me, listen. I do not take it lightly when a man or woman of God allow me to step into their pool pit because what they're saying is, Stetford, I trust you with our congregation's life. And the fact that you invite me back, I'm just tickled. Praise the Lord. Let's stand to our feet and receive God's parting blessing. Raise your hands to the heavens. Now may the great I am, the creator 
and sustainer of all things, may he bless you. May you see how much he loves you and that he is with you in the thick of things. May you leave this place understanding that you are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Just as you have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, you are now reconcilers in Jesus' name, helping others be reconciled to God. So may you be the bearer of good news wherever you go, knowing that every place your feet touches is holy ground. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week, church. Well, every single day your grace reminds me that my best days I 